and then his son, who is also Carl Urban with blonde hair, is in the movie? Did you know that? Yeah. Did you know Dredd is in that movie? Yeah. I did not, because he's blonde. I did not recognize it. What were we talking about? Nerds are nerds are nerds are nerds. For example, if you know me, you know I'm a huge Magic the Gathering nerd. I play all the time, and this relates into a previous episode of Because Science. How? Well, look at this card. It has a weird name. It's a classic card from the game. It's called Nevenral's Disc. But look at it more closely. What is Nevenral backwards? If you read it backwards, it literally spells out Larry Niven, the legendary sci-fi author Larry Niven, who is famous for what? His book Ringworld in the Ringworld series. So you have science fiction author, science geeks, Magic the Gathering players. We all overlap. Isn't it good? Hello and welcome to another edition of Because Science Footnotes, the companion show to Because Science where I take all of your comments, questions, and corrections and I address them in this nerdy artifact creature I call a video. And then I tell you what's coming up next on this very channel. And hint uh, for that, we're going to make something go faster than light. Believe it? Huh. But getting right down to it, in the last episode of Because Science, which you can find pinned in the YouTube comments below, we were talking about the science and the history and the physics of Project Thor, one of the most famous, almost made space weapons of all time. We went through its capabilities, its engineering, its physics, its history, who made it, how much would it blow stuff up them? If you haven't seen the video, please go watch it, but I have a bunch of nerdy comments and corrections from you, so oh, what did you have to say? A lot of caffeine. I'm on the fiend train. Frequent commenter Herb Gore says, and thus Sir Isaac Newton's remains the deadliest SOB in space, which is a reference to a line in Mass Effect 2. And yes, what is really interesting about space warfare when you really think about it is that it doesn't have to be necessarily all futuristic lasers and nuclear weapons. It could just be something relatively simple like Project Thor. Force equals mass times acceleration. Just pushing a rock in space could be the deadliest thing about space warfare. And and side note, I will bring up that line, that reference in Mass Effect 2 comes from the guy who wrote the Atomic Rockets website where I met original super nerd Matterbeam. It all comes back together. Venn diagram. Oops. Our next comment comes from a young Mr. BF who says, with all this supervillain talk, footnotes should just start with the back of the chair and then slowly turning around and petting a cat. Well, I don't have a cat here, but okay. Okay, wait, let me try. All right, let me try something. Ow, ow. Oh, hello. Didn't notice you there. I was just admiring my last adversary. <laughs> he thought he could get one over on me too. <laughs> and now it's a bowling ball. <laughs> ow, too heavy. What is this, 16? Strike. LR Bearclaw asks, gotta ask, what happened to Because Space? I feel like this would have fit well there as well as here. Well, I Because Space is still an ongoing thing. Of course, we're still doing it. Dr. Moo is still lovely and intelligent, and she's coming back to the channel, and I cannot wait. The reason why we haven't been posting Because Space as of late is because Dr. Moo has a very fancy day job where she's literally building robots that go to Mars. So we have to work around her schedule. I'm stuck here in the void for eternity. She has a day job, so we work around her schedule. But I can say this, more episodes of Because Space are on the way. Just Think says, so if Elon Musk makes space travel cheaper, can we enact Project Thor? Well, that's an interesting question. Let me think about it. Yeah. Dr. Larry Pornell said himself that if the cost of getting a kilogram into low Earth orbit were to come way down, like the cost of, you know, getting a passenger flight 
then Project Thor would become a lot more feasible. But as it stands right now, it is just prohibitively expensive because for the yield of a rod from God, even though it is a lot, like 50 billion joules, you can still just have a weapon like a bomb that is much, much more destructive that you can get to an area, not as quickly, but for much more cheaply than you could setting up an entire system of orbiting telephone poles. So still hasn't happened yet. And Elon Musk, to his credit, has lowered the cost of private uh, space freight and space cargo, but still, I don't think it's quite enough. It still has to come way down. But the nerdiest comment at the time I'm filming this episode, I gotta give to now frequent commenter Jeff F, who goes into something a little bit more dastardly than even Project Thor. He goes on to talk about why we would use something like a telephone pole shape and not a spherical shape, because in addition to being able to fit a lot more mass behind the cross-sectional area, which is important for drag, a long cylinder is more stabilized in flight than something like a perfect sphere, which is the difference between, say, a musket ball and a rifle bullet. But then Jeff F. has this super villain worthy plan. A much more devastating, cheaper, and super villainous plot would be to just blow up chaff in Earth's orbit. It wouldn't cause nuclear fallout, no expensive rods, or systems of satellite. Just blow up a commercial kitchen's worth of Reynolds wrap in space, and the world is going to be in trouble. This pseudo Kepler syndrome-like effect has the ability to render most, if not all, communication satellites in orbit inoperable for some time, if not forever. Fill it with little things like screws and bolts, and you would even cause massive damage to the Earth's orbital infrastructure. So what Jeff is suggesting is inducing a Kepler syndrome. Kepler syndrome is when there is so much space junk orbiting the Earth at such a high velocity, like eight kilometers per second, that you cannot leave Earth anymore. If you try to leave the ground in, say, a spaceship, some tiny fleck of space trash will puncture your hull like a bullet, like you were butter, like you weren't even there. So inducing Kepler syndrome by blowing up tiny, basically nail bombs in orbit, that's, that's way more villainous than anything I ever came up with. And now I'm adding it to the things that I'm never mind. So for all that, Jeff, you are now indeed a super nerd. Ah! But of course, I'm not always right. I have a terrible time with people's names because I don't allot the appropriate attention to them. I was trying to think of uh, who Bruce Springsteen was and all I could uh, come up with was Big David. <laughs> you know, Big David, the singer, nobody's perfect. <laughs> so what did I get wrong last week? Well, our first correction comes from a few of you, like Rawket and Jeep, who says, well, what about the Outer Space Treaty? Wouldn't something like Project Thor be banned under the Outer Space Treaty to prevent weapons of mass destruction in orbit and the like? Well, as some of you in the comments, some of you super nerds actually pointed out, there is no explicit banning of something like Project Thor in the Outer Space Treaty. Um, I'm reading from the San Francisco Chronicle here, quote, such hypervelocity bundles of metal are not specifically disallowed by the 1972 Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, which explicitly prohibits only developing nuclear weapons in space. The rods, however, they go on to say, would violate the spirit of the more general Outer Space Treaty. So while the rods from God might violate the spirit of a treaty, they're not explicitly banned. And so an enterprising supervillain could do it. But then again, supervillains aren't really worried about treaties that much, are they? I know I'm not. The only treaties I'm worried about are crispy. Crispy treaties. <laughs> Our next correction comes from frequent commenter Horrier, who says, I understand the force behind these rods, nice, but I can't really see how these would be accurate enough to have a military function. It is a hunk of metal without a real guidance system outside of its initial launch. When falling from orbit to the ground, just a tiny deviation can decide whether or not you hit or miss. Yes, I agree with you, Horrier, but Dr. Pornell did think about this and envision these rods having some sort of uh, orientation system, like uh, fins that could be adjusted, and some guidance system that would link up to GPS. Also, Dr. Pornell estimated that uh, the achievable accuracy, I'm quoting him here, here, the achievable accuracy would be estimated to be about 10 to 20 feet CEP. CEP standing for a circular error of probability, the radius of a circle 
uh, in which 50% of the missiles will fall. So if you launched two missiles, at least one of them would could fall and hit a target in a radius of 10 to 20 feet. Being able to hit something from space anywhere in the world within minutes, within 10 to 20 feet, which isn't that much wider than what you're looking at right now on my scale, is pretty surprisingly accurate. So I think these things could have a tactical advantage in that way, but they still do have other problems. Armac Armac 123 has a correction who says, would it not be much more effective if you just use an actual nuke coated in tungsten? And I'm assuming you mean then drop that from space, like dropping a nuke from space. Well, for this, you're kind of getting around the main advantage that something like Project Thor would give you, which is something that's really, really cheap and mass producible. We have a lot of nuclear weapons, but they're not exactly mass producible in the same way that like a giant telephone pole is mass producible. So if you can get all these up into orbit and cheaply, then you'd have a system that you could strike a lot of targets very quickly, but not, with not as much yield. If you can already get nukes to space or you can already get nukes anywhere in the world and quickly like Project Thor, then yes, obviously the higher yield, thousands of times higher yield is gonna be much more effective, but that's not really what we're talking about here. Dr. Pornell himself did say with the current cost, Project Thor just really isn't practical at all. You can get just a bomb to any location with a lot more damage. So your point is taken, but dropping a nuke from space kind of defeats the purpose of the, yeah, you know. Benjamin Klein says, ha ha, love the intro. <laughs> I, if, by commenting on YouTube, you, uh, legally allow me to give you any voice that I think you have. But how destructive would a Tesla Roadster be if fired from space? That's how Benjamin Klein sounds. Well, Benjamin, as we said in the episode, NASA has some estimations for what will make it through the atmosphere. For a Tesla Roadster to make it through the atmosphere, it is not like a space rock. It's not as dense. It's not as dense, probably, and it's much smaller than NASA's estimated figure of how big something needs to be to make it all the way through the atmosphere, atmospheric heating, and get down to the ground, which is 25 meters, which is 75 feet. A Tesla Roadster is not 75 feet in diameter, and it's made out of metal, and it would probably need a heat shield, or else that metal is going to get to thousands of degrees, and the car is going to rip itself apart, and a Tesla Roadster will probably not make it to the ground, depending on the angle of the car during re-entry. So, I do not think that a Tesla Roadster would make a very good rod from God. But the nerdiest correction at the time I'm filming this here episode, I'm giving to The Chopping Block, who says a lot of great stuff about how you could enact Project Thor for real if you were being real kind of dastardly about it. All this supervillain stuff, I have no idea where it's coming from. But they mentioned something very interesting near the end. Plausible deniability. One of the things you might not necessarily think about if you're using uh, kinetic bombardment as a tactic is that if you were, say, just some space pirates and you put a, an engine on the back of a space rock and you flung it towards a planet and it took a year to get there and then it finally impacted and it destroyed a city and it was a terrible act of your space piracy, you have plausible deniability. Space rocks are everywhere. They fall out of the sky all the time. They're in orbit in our solar system right now. Using this kind of tactic, something like a Project Thor, after it hits the ground, it might not be identifiable. You might not be able to even detect the target when it's coming in. You might not be able to see the system where it came from or how far away it was fired from. So with something like Project Thor or just putting something like uh, an engine on the back of a space rock like Isaac Newton would want you to do in space, you have the plausible deniability that, hey, I have no idea where that came from, but I'm glad it was destroyed. <laughs> so plausible deniability with orbital bombardment is a big advantage, potentially, of space warfare. And for thinking about that and being right about that, the chopping block, you are indeed a super nerd. It came out of my mouth. You'll see. And now, moving right along to this week's episode of Because Science. On this week's episode, and I cannot stress this enough, it's not a supervillain thing, we're going to construct a faster than light guillotine in space. <laughs> not, not evil though. That's right, in this week's episode of Because Science, we are gonna go through some phenomena that apparently break the universal speed limit. Yes, nothing can go faster than the speed of light, but that depends on what you mean by thing. And we might be able to make something 
that goes a little bit faster than light, a lot a bit faster than light. And will it be evil and could you use it? Ah, but before we get to all that, please go watch the latest episode of Because Science if you haven't yet, all about Project Thor, and leave me all of your best, nerdiest comments, corrections, and questions at youtube.com slash because science, facebook.com slash because science, and at because science on Instagram and Twitter. And make sure you're getting in early when these videos drop. I do not have all the time in the world to get all of your comments before filming footnotes, but I do read, I'd say, between 600 and 1,000 comments before I make it. So get in there and get nerdy. And don't forget, how much wood could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? Well, that depends on the other side. <laughs> how much wood could a woodchuck chuck if a wood ch <laughs> How much wood could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? Well, that depends on the average size of a woodchuck burrow, which is actually a groundhog. How much wood could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? Well, that depends on the average size of a woodchuck burrow, which is actually a groundhog, and they move based on the average size of the burrow, about 700 pounds of dirt. So that means if a woodchuck could chuck wood, it'd be about 700 pounds.